All right. Then uh, judges, uh, you can take over. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Candida Steele, and I'm retired as a judge on the U.S. Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. I've handled government contract disputes around the country, and I've been from the state of Maryland. I live in the state of Maryland until last Friday and um, have spent 20 years doing this program and love it dearly. So I'm very glad to see all of your faces here. And Kurt. All right, good morning here, good afternoon there. My name is uh, Kurt Mavis. I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force, uh, practicing attorney for about 12 years now, currently in Colorado Springs, Colorado, teaching at the Air Force Academy. I'm Richard Leiter. I'm a professor and uh, director of the Law Library at the University of Nebraska, College of Law, here in Lincoln, Nebraska been uh, judging state We the People competitions for about 15 years. Um, this is my first time at the Nationals, so I'm a little bit nervous, so go easy on me. No, um, but I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Great. And if you'd introduce yourselves, I'll then read the question. Good morning and afternoon. We are Unit 5, representing Wauwatosa West High School as the state champions from Wisconsin. My name is Ella Schwantes. I'm Ben Soboleski. I'm Marissa Retta. I'm Layla Allen. I'm Kate DeCastri. And we are here on behalf of our mentors, teaching assistants, and teacher, Mr. Chad Mateski. Great. Hi. Welcome all. Uh, so the question that we're discussing today is uh, Unit 5. Uh, a result of the decision in Wisconsin versus Yoder is that any parent slash guardian can refuse to let their child go to school beyond the eighth grade or learn about a subject by saying it's against their religious beliefs. Do you agree or disagree with the result of this decision? Why or why not? What words, if any, are found in the U.S. Constitution or in state constitutions that protect the right to an education? And how have courts balanced religious beliefs with other rights? You may begin. Spiritual freedom is the root of political liberty. As the union between spiritual freedom and political liberty seems nearly inseparable, it is our duty to defend both. Thomas Paine's words embody the necessity of religious freedom as a means of maintaining liberty. However, Paine's notion of the two being inseparable only goes so far in the pursuit to defend both. The courts have developed evolving standards to balance religious beliefs with other rights. Reynolds v. U.S. is one of the first cases to develop such a standard. The court ruled that polygamy is not protected by the First Amendment. Justice Waite, writing for the unanimous court, justified this decision in a manner that would prevent individuals from gaining greater power to govern themselves. Nearly 80 years after the Reynolds decision, in 1962, the court departed from this president in Sugar v. Burner. The Supreme Court held that if states do not accommodation for religiously motivated conduct, sufficiently burdening citizens' religious beliefs, and they must have a compelling interest. In the 1990 Supreme Court case, Employment Division v. Smith, the court narrowed the standards formulated in Sherbert v. Verner. Writing for the majority opinion, Justice Scalia referred back to Reynolds v. U.S., articulating that the First Amendment's free exercise clause safeguards religious beliefs. However, religious exercise can be limited by laws generally applied to all citizens. In response to the conclusion in Employment Division v. Smith, Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The RFRA required courts to use strict scrutiny when examining laws relating to religious freedom. The court reinterpreted the compelling interest requirements used in balancing religious beliefs and other rights. The court's fluctuating opinion on religious exercise has affected decisions on other rights, such as marriage, bodily autonomy, and notably education. Our panel agrees with the result in Wisconsin v. Yoder. However, some of our panel disagrees with how the court failed to take into account the religious practices or beliefs of the child. The court argued that only the parents are subject to prosecution for exercising their religious beliefs, and therefore the desire of the child is irrelevant. Those who don't align with the court agree with Justice Douglas in his partial extent, where he recognizes the religious interests of the child as an individual. In the case of Zark v. Clausen, the court recognized the right of students to freely practice their religious beliefs. And in Tinker v. Des Moines, students' voices were recognized by the courts. In the case of Wisconsin v. Yoder, the court should have relied on these precedents and acknowledged the rights of children as students. 
There are no words in the US Constitution that directly protect the right to an education. The court has protected the right to education through the Due Process Clause, using the Equal Protection Clause. In 1982, with Pye v. Doe, the court struck down a Texas law that allowed the states to withhold funding from local school districts that educate undocumented immigrants. All 50 states have a right to education listed in their constitution, with 37 including religious restrictions. In Article 10, Section 3 of the Wisconsin Constitution, it provides students have a right to an equal opportunity for a sound-based education. The unanimous acknowledgement of a right to education at the state level demonstrates the necessity of preserving education for future generations. This conflict between religion and other rights was recognized in Reynolds v. U.S. when Justice Waite stated, the question is raised whether religious belief can be accepted as a justification of an overt act made criminal by the law of the land. Since originally posed, this question has been inconsistently answered by the courts. The efforts of the courts, however, have been admirable as deciding on a case-by-case -case basis is necessary when balancing rights of such importance. Thank you. This concludes our statement. We are now ready for your follow-up. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was muted. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, what do you, what does the separation of church and state mean in, especially in the context of, of this case? The separation of church and state means that the state cannot sponsor a specific religion. This can be seen in the Supreme Court case, Angle v. Town, where they allowed public schools to not recite prayer at the beginning of the school district, even if it was not a denominational and did not require students to recite it as it was a violation of church and state as it has supported the Christian religion. After the incorporation doctrine, there was a large separation between church and state as seen in Everson, the Board of Education. Uh, there, there was a, uh, the point was raised that there was now a high and, impregnable, high and impregnable wall separating church and state. The separation of church and state refers to the establishment clause where the government establishes in the constitution in the first amendment that they cannot have an established or endorsed religion. But doesn't the government endorse a religion every time they make a free exercise clause decision? It's inherently endorsing the value of whatever religious tenant is at issue. It's okay to endorse religions as long as we're all endorsing religions equally. The, issue becomes when a religion is specifically targeted or left out due to discrimination. I wouldn't say that we're exactly endorsing religion. I would say that we're protecting religion, as can be seen in the case Lukumi Babalui, the city of Halia, where the religion was subject to regulations. However, other religions were not subject to these regulations. This case, in turn, protected that religion where the law was on its face discriminatory against the said religion. And by not establishing a church, we can see that this has led to more exercise of religion. This can be seen in the Supreme Court case, Santa Fe School District v. Doe, where they did not allow the Christian prayer to be recited but by students publicly. However, each student could privately recite their own religious beliefs. The courts have not even come up with a conclusive definition as to what religion is. The only way you can really figure it out is by looking through dictionaries such as the Oxford Dictionary, where it states that a religion is a highly held belief in a superhuman being. Okay, so let's take that. How, what legal means do we have or do the courts have to determine the um, answer to that definition when someone comes up to you with whatever belief and says, I believe in a, uh, what, what was the definition? Supreme being or, yeah. Uh, in section 163 of the IRS, a government funded program, there needs to be an established church of worship. So the courts have decided religions such as the Pastafarian religion to be religious satire because there is no established church of worship. But we can also see that the church cannot determine the validity of a religious belief as stated in U.S. v. Ballard. However, they can determine if a religious belief is sincerely held. And that for that reason, we have to protect religions. As seen in Wisconsin v. Yoder, when the parents wanted to take their children out of school, the government had to uphold, uphold this religion as well as the right to parent. 
Okay, it, you touched on this in your opening remarks about the, the rights of the students in this situation. How do you define the rights of students? How, how, how strong do you take into account the rights of the children? And at what age does it uh, transfer to the parents? I would choose the age of 14. This is when children have the right in courts of foster care. Uh, when it comes to foster care court cases, uh, at the age of 14 is the age that they have selected where children have a say. So I think that this should be applied for uh, the student's right to education at that age. I would choose the age of 15 as this is when the death penalty can apply to children. And so if the death penalty can apply, why should children not have a say in their education? However, in Wisconsin v. Yoder, it was ruled that parents' decisions would override the students until age 18 when they became of legal age to be heard in court opinions. In, in particular for students' rights, kids' rights as students, as seen in Tinker v. Des Moines, students have the rights within the school, within the schoolhouse gates, all rights listed in the Constitution, I mean, in the Bill of Rights. And this can also be seen in West Virginia v. Barnett when a little girl was able to voice her opinion within the school. However, these rights of the students in a school can be limited through court cases such as Morris v. Frederick, where it extends not only to the school itself, but to school sanctioned events such as this competition. <laughs> All right, now it's my turn. Um, here's, here's my struggle. Kate, you mentioned it in your opening statement. It's been inconsistent. What is the correct test for the court to hold? Do you agree with RIFRA and that it should be strict scrutiny? Should we toss out RIFRA? The Supreme Court should uphold the compelling interest test. This means that, this is, and as seen in Sherbert v. Burner, this means when someone would place a substantial burden on a religion, the state must have a compelling interest. I believe that if the Supreme Court case on a decision of polygamy were to come from the Supreme Court today, like in U.S. v. Reynolds, this would be overturned due to the compelling interest test. There is no place for discrimination in our society. So I believe that uh, the religion has become the point where discrimination has, be allowed, has been allowed, such as in Masterpiece, Masterpiece Cake Shop. Canada, you're muted again. Keep the dogs quiet. Um, do you, um, so do you think Yoder's good law anymore? I believe Yoder is good law. We can see that in the majority opinion of Wisconsin v. Yoder, that the extra years of education would place a substantial burden without enough compelling interest on the Amish religion. I believe that Yoder is a good law for protecting religious interests. However, we must make sure that these are the child's religious interests as losing an edu education is such an invaluable, thing to happen. So we need to make sure that we protect their individual liberty interests. Yoder is good law. Uh, as protected in Trotsky v. Granville, the right to parent is deeper, deeply rooted in tradition and history, and we must uphold that right. Yoder is good law as the right to parent, as Ben said, can be extremely important. As we can see with the new Harvard study, that children who are raised in religious households tend to have a less um, higher depression rate. Yoder upheld the natural right and the negative right of religion. This should be upheld in the current in the current court case, um, Tandon v. Newsom, where in California they are restricting religious religious organizations, but are not restricting restaurants from gatherings. However, we must acknowledge that Yoder could be invalid due to freedom of conscience of the students. This is seen in my room where Baraska with the Supreme Court recognized that an expansion of knowledge such as other languages expands freedom of conscience imperative to the development of the students. Wow, great wow. job. Yeah. Holy smokes. <clears throat> so Richard, do you wanna start? Well, I'm just blown away. Um, I was very impressed uh, by two things. Number one, your enthusiasm. Um, it poured out of the camera, and I'm, I just, I love that. Um, people getting excited about the Constitution makes a law professor's heart just <laughs> jump, jump for joy. 
And, um, but then your knowledge, you all seemed very comfortable and eager to express your opinion. And you drew on a lot of um, cases, a lot of facts, um, current events. I, I think we could have probably engaged in this conversation for the rest of the day, but we don't have time. So, but thank you, you should, you should all be very proud. Great, Kurt? Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I haven't seen this before, but the first time Ben did this to me, I thought he was just saying, what's up? I was like, hey, hey, man, what's going on, man? That's cool. Uh, but no, I, I, I thought that was a great way for you all to interact with each other. And that's so important. So um, Chad, I know you're out there listening. Thank you for trying to replicate the, the in-person as much as possible. I see the groups in the background. I think that's awesome. That brings that energy. So um, it, it showed up here. Wonderful conversation. This is challenging. Um, there, there's no right answer, obviously, and that's why we can continue to talk about it. But uh, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Great job. That was really fascinating. And, and I agree completely with my colleagues and the enthusiasm that you've brought, I hope, means that you've really been bitten by this experience. Um, there are certainly a lot of people who this changes the direction of their life. And I have a cousin who ended up going to Oxford in political science as a PhD from Oxford now, thanks to this program. So, you know, the sky's the limit. And what I really hope is, um, you know, you might end up wanting to be a photographer or an artist or a dentist or something, but in the very least, you'll be a wonderful citizen and a great influence on the people around you. And what I really hope while I'm sitting in my nursing in my nursing home on rocking on the porch, is that you all, some some of you will decide not just to be a good citizen, but to represent the rest of us who need you desperately to do so. We really need people in the government who know what they're talking about and who know what it means to be in the government and what the constitution means. So you've already got such a head start on everybody else. Um, I hope you will take this and, and run with it because um, it will entertain and fascinate you for the rest of your lives. So congratulations. Thank you all of you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.